this is uh, Windows Hooks of Death, kernel attacks through user mode callbacks with Tarjay Min. All right. Uh, so uh, welcome to my talk. Um, like I said, this is uh, kernel attacks through user mode callbacks. Um, first, a bit about myself. I'm a security researcher at Norman. Uh, I work uh, as part of the malware detection team. Uh, my interests are vulnerability research, operating system internals. I've also done some past work on kernel exploitation uh, in the context of the kernel pool uh, on Windows 7 specifically. I've also done some work on mitigations on, on for instance, trying to mitigate null planner exploitation on Windows. Uh, so this talk is going to be about uh, several vulnerability classes <coughs> Uh, in Windows related to Windows hooks and user mode callbacks. Uh, these eventually end up being uh, several unique classes like null pointed references and use after freeze. Uh, they resulted in 44 patch privilege escalation vulnerabilities in MS 11034 back in April and MS 11054 last month. And there was also several unannounced uh, vulnerabilities that were uh, also patched as part of the variant discovery process. Uh, for us to understand all these bugs, we need to go into several mechanisms specific to Windows NT or the kernel itself and Win32K. So a lot of the background material is going to be on that. Uh, so this is the agenda. Uh, we'll start with a brief introduction, move on to talk about Win32K. Uh, the window manager specifically, because that's a lot, uh, that's basically the component of Win32K that we're concerned with, and user mode callbacks. Uh, we'll look at uh, several of the vulnerabilities. Uh, we'll look at their exploitability, and we'll also try to mitigate uh, exploitation uh, of some of these issues. And we'll uh, wrap up with some conclusive remarks in the end. Uh, so just for a brief introduction to begin with, uh, so the Windows GUI subsystem was traditionally all implemented in user mode, and this was done as a uh, client-server process model, uh, a client being the application, the server being uh, CSRSS. Uh, in NT 4.0, uh, the server component was moved to kernel mode, and this was what introduced Win32K.sys. Uh, this was uh, about 15 or 16 years ago. Uh, so today, Win32K manages uh, both the window manager and the graphics device interface. I'll talk more about those later. Um, so user mode callbacks allows Win32K to make calls back into user mode uh, to operate on user mode data. And the reason it does this is to, for instance, invoke application-defined hooks, uh, provide event notifications, or uh, read and set uh, properties in uh, user mode structures. Uh, it's implemented, the mechanism itself is implemented in the NT executive. So there's an export that uh, Win32K calls. And it's pretty much, working, it's pretty much a uh, reverse system call. So uh, it's about the opposite of what you would expect for, uh, for a system call. Uh, so you know, to sum up briefly, uh, Win32K uses a global locking design in creating a thread safe environment, or the window manager does. Uh, and this is presumably, uh, you know, remnants of the old subsystem design. So these callbacks actually interrupt kernel execution and thus allow Win32K structures and objects to be modified while you're executing on user mode. Uh, so if you don't sufficiently check for, uh, you know, changes, uh, you could have a number of different vulnerability classes, like I said earlier. Uh, so there's a, you know, there's a few, you know, some interesting previous work in this field. Uh, Thomas Garnier had a paper in Uninformed uh, some years ago on local privilege escalations in Win32K. This was actually on user mode callbacks, but it was more on the validation of the data returned from the callback and not on the, the state of Win32K itself. Uh, there was also some interesting vulnerabilities patched in la last year. Uh, the window creation vulnerabilities. And one of these actually was on changes. So the, the uh, MS-10-32 uh, did not, uh, was a, a bug where the current, or where Win32K did not sufficiently 
revalidate the parent or window after a callback. So this was kind of like up the alley where, where this research is going. Uh, and Stefan Eisler uh, also had a talk. This is not related to Windows uh, kernel at all, but it's, it was a, a similar bug class uh, in which he had a privileged component that made calls back into a non-privileged context, and he could change around uh, on the uh, privileged state. Uh, so, you know, the goal of this talk is to show how user mode callbacks, uh, without very stringent checks, uh, may introduce several subtle, subtle vulnerabilities. Uh, they, we'll also try to show how such vulnerabilities can be exploited, for instance, using pool or heap uh, manipulation. And finally, we'll try to propose a method to generically mitigate uh, null pointed reference vulnerabilities. So that was briefly uh, on the contents. So we'll go over to Winter UK. Uh, so like I said earlier, uh, the older version of Win Winter UK or Windows itself, or actually you know, Windows in general, is a modified microkernel design, meaning that file system, network protocols, and drivers you know, were our role in kernel mode. Uh, but in NT 3.51, uh, they followed a more pure microkernel approach on the implementation of the GUI subsystem. Uh, so this means that the window manager and GDI was implemented in user mode. And even though that is, might be slow in some contexts, they used a lot of optimizations like share memory design, sharing memory between the client and the server process, and using paired threads to, to uh, make uh, the time slicing uh, of context switching more efficient. Uh, so you know this is what pretty much it looks like back then. Uh, you had all these components in user mode, and you had a limited executive uh, services that you know um, did the, the necessarily kernel processing uh, of these components. Um, so um, you know the drawbacks of this design was that you know even though you had all this code in user mode, a lot of the graphics in the Windows subsystem relies on interacting with hardware. So you're still required to make calls to kernel mode. So that was one of the reasons why, hey, why don't we just do everything in kernel mode since, you know, since we have to make this, these system calls anyway. Uh, and also you know, the client-server interaction you know, involves excessive thread and context switching. So that was one of the uh, fundamental drawbacks uh, of this design. And like I said, they use the shared memory between the client and the server process. So you know, each paired thread had to have a 64K shared memory buffer. And this you know, turned out to be quite high in terms of memory requirements. Uh, so in Windows NT 4.0, they moved the, these uh, components, or many of the compo components, to kernel mode. Uh, so this eliminated the need for shared buffers and paired threads. You know, there were way fewer thread and context switches. Uh, you know, reduced memory requirements, but they still use some performance tricks such as caching or mapping kernel mode structures into user mode. And this is, uh, you know, it's good for performance, but really uh, bad for, you know, exploitation or good for exploitation. Um, so, you know, in Windows NT 4.0, uh, there's not much left in CSRSS. Uh, and today, there's even less because they moved out the console as well. So, um, so Win32 K is really just the kernel component of the Win32 subsystem, like the graphics subsystem. Uh, it implements the kernel side of the window manager, the graphics device interface. It, it provides also thunks to DirectX interfaces. And it has its own system call table. So whenever you interact with this module, you go through all of these system call tables. So on Windows 7, there's uh, 800 entries. So the attack surface is uh, quite large. Um, so the window manager, uh, its primary responsibility is, is to control window displays. It manages screen output, collects input from keyboard and mouse. Uh, it calls application-defined hooks, uh, passes the messaging between applications, and it also manages the user objects, which we'll discuss later on. So this is, that, this is the component that this talk focuses on. Uh, the GDI interface, or uh, graphics device interface, you know, manages the raw graphics output itself. 
So it has a library of graphics functions that you know, that uh, uh, all the uh, user components uh, call. So it, this includes functions for uh, line text, you know, figure drawing, graphics manipulation, and you also have GDI objects uh, like brushes, pens, DCs, uh, paths, regions, and you have APIs for uh, video and print drivers as well. Uh, GDI is pretty slow compared to DirectX, so you know at some point it's probably uh, going to be replaced, but you know, as long as there's backwards compatibility to worry about, it's not probably going to happen anytime soon. Um, so that was uh, briefly on Win32K. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the window manager. So these are, you know, the, the user objects are what builds up the managing uh, components of the Win32 subsystem. So, you know, all user handles like windows, cursors, menus, are backed by their own objects. And each of these objects has their own uh, structures. Uh, and user objects are indexed into a handle table that is maintained by Win32K. Um, so we'll talk about that in a few slides. Uh, all the objects, they start with a common header known as the head structure. And this holds the actual handle value and also a reference count that tracks object use. So this is. Uh, this is one of the vulnerability classes uh, is on the reference count or mis mis mismanagement of the reference count. Um, there's also additional fields defined if the object is owned by, say, a thread or a process, because then you want to know, you know the context uh, pointer to the thread or process object. Um, so all the user objects, they are indexed, like I said, into a handle table that is uh, defined per session. So when our user logs in, he gets his own session. So, you know, all all the handle information is uh, for a session, uh, not tied to a desktop or anything. It's global for for a user. Uh, and the pointer to this handle table is stored in a shared infrastructure, and you can actually get this from user mode. So, you can do the user32 DLL export G shared info, and you can read the handle table from user mode. And this is also because of optimization. Uh, and each entry in the user handle table is represented by a handle entry structure. So you have a handle table with all the uh, objects that is in use. So each of these objects is represented by this structure. Um, so you have the pointer to the object itself. You have a pointer to the owner. And you have a type field that defines the type of the object. Um, you have flags that define how the object is used if it's being destroyed or similar. Uh, you have also a unique seed that they use to provide entropy to the handle value itself. And the way they do this is that they increment the seed on each free of the uh, object or, or the handle table entry. Uh, this doesn't really work because the unique counter is only 16 bits, so you could easily wrap it uh, in, in a few tries. Um, so this is basically how that looks. You have the pointer to the kernel memory uh, or the object in the kernel memory. Uh, the one to the owner, uh, the object type, and destroy the flags. And you can easily dump this from user mode. Um, so user objects are stored in you know, either the session pool, the desktop heap, or the shared heap. Uh, all of these are in kernel mode, obviously. Uh, the desktop heap and the shared heap are read-only mapped into a user address space. So any process will have that, you know, invokes the GUI subsystem will have these uh, memory map mappings set up. And this is to avoid the kernel transitions. Uh, so, you know, objects associated with a particular desktop is stored in the desktop heap, and the remaining objects are either stored in the shared heap or the session pool. Uh, so, you know, when you start a GUI application, you'll have uh, these mappings set up. So it's quite easy to enumerate uh, the pointers to you know, kernel memory if you want to do exploitation or anything like that. Um, so you have the shared section that contains the user handle table and the shared heap. And each new desktop that a thread is associated with gets its own mapping into the process. So it's pretty, um, yeah. And all of this is because of performance to avoid making system calls. Uh, 
So the shared section user mapping that contains the handle table and the uh, shared heap is set up when you load user32.dll. So if you load library this DLL, um, it will you know, notify CSRSS that will set up the mapping for, for the process. Um, and the user handle table is located uh, at the base of the shared section. And this can, like I said earlier, be obtained in uh, at least two ways, uh, either through the export in user32 or by calling this function to CSRSS. And then CSRSS returns uh, a pointer to, to the handle table in user mode. So we can easily uh, you know, make an application that dumps all these information uh, you know, without any privileges or anything. So it's, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's quite convenient when you work on exploitation. Uh, you get all this information for free. Um, so the desktop heap user mapping is set up for each thread. So Win32K maps the associated desktop heap into the user mode process whenever uh, you, you invoke a new desktop or, or create a new desktop. Uh, the information uh, about the desktop heap is stored in its own structure, so you get the, the kernel address of the desktop heap from user mode as well. Um, and the way they do, the reason they do this is to compute the address of the user mode a location uh, of the, these objects. So they take the uh, pointer to the uh, desktop heap in the kernel, and they use a delta that is also readable from user mode, and then they know the uh, address uh, of the uh, user mode mapping. Because they don't store pointers to user mode, they only store pointers to kernel mode, so that's why you see all these kernel mode pointers when you poke around in the desktop heap. So for them to look up you know, other objects, they do this to find the uh, right location in user mode. So again, we can, we can do more. We can, we can look up objects. We can inspect them. We can you know, see the window procedures, uh, the lock count of the head structure, et cetera. Um, so I'll demo this later on. So you know, on Windows 7, there's uh, 21 different user object types. Uh, so there's. Uh, Actually, there's 22, including the free type, which is zero. And this also includes the touch and get gesture objects that were introduced in uh, Windows 7. And information on all these types are stored in something known as the handle type, type information table. And uh, this isn't mapped into user mode, but you can get, if you look up this table and look at the uh, structures, you can you can find out the target memory location of each of these objects, and also their destroy routines. Um, so, you know, here's the table of. Uh, uh, this is quite convenient to us. Uh, you know, you can see all the uh, the locality of all the objects. Uh, who's the owner? So, when you know the owner, you know the uh, additional uh, header structures. For instance, if it's a thread structure or thread thread own. Uh, it has a pointer to the thread infrastructure. If it's processed owned, it has a pointer to the process infrastructure. Um, uh, so, and all of these, uh, you know, like I said, the session pool is not mapped into user mode. So it's uh, the ones that we have access to is really just the uh, desktop heap and the shared heap uh, objects. Uh, so, you know, as you can see at the bottom, we have two new objects in Windows 7, the touch and gesture types. Um, so, you know, what's interesting about the window manager is that it does not exclusively lock each of these objects. So when you try to use an object, uh, you would think that, you know, it had some mutual exclusion, uh, like a dispatch header or dispatcher header uh, on the object itself, but it actually it locks the entire window manager. So it has a global lock whenever it operates on these, uh, uh, on these objects or any of the data structures in, in, in Win32K. Uh, so when you try to operate on a global data structure, it uses an exclusive lock if you know, write operations are involved. And otherwise, it tries to use a shared lock. So obviously, if you only read uh, from the structures, the share lock is better because you don't have to freeze up the entire subsystem. Uh, so this was clear enough designed to be multi-threaded. Uh, you know, no two applications on separate desktops or actually separate window stations 
within the same session can process their message queues simultaneously. It's not possible because of this model. So you can see here that the, uh, you know, how a function typically looks like when you try to invoke a Win32K system call. Uh, the first one acquires a share lock, while the second one acquires a exclusive lock. And it, although they don't say share lock, they use the term critical sections. So when they say enter shared crit, they mean that they acquired a share lock while they, well, when you enter the user critical section, you exclusively lock this section. So that's nice. Uh, so we'll see how user mode callbacks tie into this. Uh, First, I'll just go over what user mode callbacks actually are. Uh, so in interacting with user mode data, uh, Win32K is required to make calls back into user mode. Uh, and this led to the concept of user mode callbacks. Uh, the mechanism itself is, uh, like I said uh, briefly in the introduction, uh, in KE user mode callback uh, in the Entos kernel. Uh, and it works like a reverse system call. Uh, you know, although there's not a lot of research on this field, uh, there were some good papers and blog posts, one by Ivan LeFou and by um, Thomas Garnier. Uh, and you know, this mechanism, uh, although used a lot in Window Manager, it's used extensively in user object handling itself. Uh, so this is because a lot of the objects store, for instance, data in user mode. So the prototype for this function looks like this. So Win32K calls this function. Uh, it provides an API number that is the index into the callback table in user mode. Uh, so when it makes the transition back to user mode, uh, it looks up the pointer to this table. And it, that table is stored in user32.dll. So this might may not make much sense, but maybe this slide or the next slide will probably be better to look at. Um, I'll just go through this first. Uh, so in a system call, you know, a trap frame is stored on the kernel thread stack. Uh, and this is to save context. So when you return from the kernel, you want to uh, restore those registers. Uh, so, you know, the user mode callback mechanism does the opposite. It creates a new, so this is in the kernel, it creates a new uh, trap frame and fakes the EIP. So it sets the EIP to, EIP to uh, KI user callback dispatcher that then calls the user32 function. Um, and it also you know, copies the input buffer to the user mode stack. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, one other thing to note is that in this mechanism on WISTA and Windows 7, it switches the kernel stack. Uh, on XP, it usually growed, uh, you know, expanded the kernel stack while on, on Windows 7 and Wista, they, they, uh, there were some issues with that, so they just switch it to another kernel stack and then switch it back when you return. Um, so here you can see the uh, callback to the user mode callback. Uh, it looks up one of the functions. Uh, so in this case, uh, the callback was a, an event callback. Uh, so it calls into the application that set this uh, event and then uh, executes the code that user uh, specifies. Uh, this is done in user mode, so this is OK. Uh, and then you return back to where you left off in the kernel using NT callback return. And this you know, reverses the, uh, sets up the original thread stack, you know, cleans up, and, and continues where you left, on, left off. Uh, so yeah, the NT callback return is uh, the function that returns uh, I think I already said this. Uh, it also deletes the kernel callback stack up in completion and uh, yeah, copies the result back to the kernel, kernel thread stack. So uh, there's some you know, different applications of user mode callbacks. Uh, like I mentioned in, uh, in the introduction, there's you know, use it for invoking application Windows hooks, uh, providing event notifications copying data from user mode or to user mode. And this is, for instance, used in DDE handling. Uh, hooks also allow users to execute code in response to certain events. Uh, so you can say you want a hook uh, invoked when you call a window procedure, when you create and destroy a window, 
uh, when you process the keyboard or mouse input, so you can have the application be notified about all of these events. Um, so for instance, if you create a window, uh, you can have a CBT hook that's a computer-based training hook uh, set up to inspect the properties and the orientation of the window. And you can also change around on, on the orientation of the window. So, you know, th this is something the, uh, the application can do quite easily. Uh, and upon returning, you know, this, this kernel function will complete and then the handle is finally returned to, to the, the application. And uh, yeah, this is where it kind of goes wrong. Uh, you have, when you uh, return into this function, uh, you're free to do whatever you want. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll look at this in the next section. So yes, so on to the vulnerabilities. So you're probably wondering, you know, why, why is callbacks bad? You know, what about this global lock? So you know, the user critical section, whenever a callback is executed, the kernel leaves this section. And this is to, you know, be able to perform other, ta other task tasks while, while um, you know, the user mode code is being executed. Uh, and upon returning from the callback, you know, the, uh, it re-enters the uh, critical section or reacquires the global lock. And then, you know, you have to make sure that all the objects that you had or previously referenced in this function is still in the expected state. So, you know, you could easily, you could store, before you invoke a callback, you could store a pointer to the parent or a window. So if you do a callback, change the parent, and then return, and don't sufficiently revalidate the parent or the window, you could easily, uh, you know, end up operating on freed memory or, or null pointers or whatever. Uh, so, you know, there's obviously, uh, since user mode callbacks is so tied up to how, how Windows works, uh, they, they have to use some kind of uh, scheme to, to know when callbacks may be invoked or not. So they use this uh, function name decoration scheme. So, so all functions are either prefixed XXX or ZZZ. Uh, this depends on how the function may invoke a callback. So functions prefixed XXX you know, will probably, in most cases, leave the critical section and invoke a user mode callback. Uh, in some cases, they may require a specific se set of arguments, um, but in most cases, it probably will invoke a callback. Uh, functions prefixed ZZZ, they will typically invoke a deferred event callback, uh, and this is usually not a problem, except, you know, it relies on this global value, GDV, or GDW defer win event to be uh, something else than null. If it's null, it will also invoke a callback that's immediate. Uh, so there were some issues with you know the naming scheme. So you know not all these functions were labeled correctly. So you know the programmer could assume that hey since since the callback is not invoked, I don't need to you know revalidate or lock these objects or anything. Uh, so, you know, for, for patching MS-11034, they also renamed uh, some of these functions. Um, and you can easily, uh, you know, locate undecorated functions in, say, by scripting in IDA Pro. Just look up, cross-reference all the functions that potentially may uh, call uh, KE user mode callback or exit the uh, critical section and see if any of these functions are not decorated uh, as they should. And it turns out that, you know, a lot of them still aren't, are not, so you know, it's a lot of inconsistency in, in the naming. So when you invoke a callback and have a reference to an object, uh, you expect that object to be valid when you return. So what you have to do is you have to lock the object. So the, if you remember the header, it had a lock count value, that's C lock object field. Uh, so we basically need to increment that uh, to prevent the object from being deleted. Uh, there's two ways of performing locking, and that's thread locking and assignment locking. So thread locking is usually used in the context of a thread. So you have functions like thread lock and thread unlock. Uh, if you look in the disassembly, you'll usually see that you know these functions are inlined, 
or at least the thread lock function is in line. Uh, so each thread lock entry is stored as a TL structure or a thread lock structure and stored on the list. So, so uh, you know, if the programmer forgets to, to unlock uh, and the ter and thread terminates, it will actually iterate through this list and free all the uh, entries. So, you know, this mechanism is, you know, quite, quite good actually. Um, and this is how you would typically see that in Win32K. Uh, so, you know, you see uh, that the thread lock entry is added to the thread lock list. Uh, the lock count is incremented. And then the XXX function is called that potentially may invoke a callback. And then finally, uh, the thread lock is released. So this is how it should be done. Um, you also have assignment locking. So not all locking is performed in the context of a thread. Sometimes you want to have it in the context of a process or global to the system. So this is, uh, th these are the functions you use for that. Um, so if you have an initialize, so basically you store a pointer to the object somewhere. And if that pointer is already initialized, they release the existing object reference. Um, and this, this function or this functionality does not provide the same uh, safety net, uh, so to speak, that thread locking does. Because you know, if a thread terminates in a callback, uh, the thread termination code itself has to release these references individually. individually. Uh, if they fail to do this, uh, you know, we might have some inconsistency in the lock counting. Uh, so, you know, any object expected to be valid after user mode callback should be locked. Uh, any object that no longer is used by a particular component should be unlocked or released. And like I said, if you, if you, you know, if you have mismanagement in either of these, uh, it could result in either no retention, meaning that the object was released too early, or you know, re no release, meaning that the object could never be freed, or the reference count could wrap in, in the worst case. Uh, so you know, it's it, it's quite easy to to understand, I guess. Uh, so here you have the absent locking. The user mode function could potentially destroy the object, and then the kernel uh, resumes execution and keeps on using uh, that object if it doesn't check that sufficiently. Uh, so there were some few cases. There were actually, I think, uh, you know, about 15 or 20 vulnerabilities related to object uh, reference counting. Uh, so you know, in creating a window, uh, this was actually what I uh, showed you earlier about the CBT hook. Uh, you can adjust the orientation of a window using a CBT hook. Uh, you, you can also set the Z order, like the. Uh, uh, arrangement of the window on the desktop, like from top uh, innermost to outermost, or and um, in provide and you do this by providing a handle to the window after which the new window handle is ha is uh, inserted. Uh, the problem with uh, this function uh, create window X in Win32K was that it did not sufficiently lock this uh, object. It just uh, obtained a reference to the pointer uh, to this window. And then it would in, uh, invoke subsequent callbacks uh, in which you could potentially destroy this window and then kept on using it when linking it into the uh, C order handle list. So this is basically what that looked like. Uh, you have the uh, function that looks up the handle value and stores the uh, or uh, returns the kernel object pointer. It does not lock this. It just uh, gets the kernel object pointer stores it in a local variable. Uh, you could do a callback, destroy this window, and then uh, this function would operate on freed memory. Um, here's another one. This was in keyboard layout objects. Uh, so when you load a key keyboard layout object, uh, you can optionally call this x function. And what that does is that it tries to unload a handle that you first provide. Uh, the problem with this was that uh, Win32K did not, again, uh, lock this handle. It simply got the uh, pointer to the object. Uh, so you could unload the, that handle in a user mode callback. And then the, uh, 
the remaining code would you know operate on freed memory again. Uh, so you could easily call like unload keyboard layout function, provide a handle to this uh, that was provided here, and then this function down here would uh, operate on freed memory. Uh, so you also have, um, that was one of the vulnerability classes. There's also what I like to say or call object state validation. Uh, so all objects you know, are assumed to be in a, or all objects assumed to be in a certain state should always have their state validated. Uh, and this usually involves like checking for initialized pointers or, or checking for flags or something like that. And user mode callbacks, you know, could alter the state of the object properties. So, you know, a drop-down menu could no longer be active. You know, a parent of the window has changed. If you have a DDE conversation, you know, the partner or the opposite party could be terminated. So there's a lot of things you, you need to check, uh, even though, you know, you might think there is not much to check for. Uh, so. This was for uh, another class of vulnerabilities. I think about 10 of them were in DDE conversation state handling. Uh, so DDE, or dynamic data exchange, is the legacy protocol for passing data between uh, applications. Uh, so Windows still supports this. Uh, and you know, several functions did not sufficiently validate the, uh, the changes that occurred after using all the callbacks. So it did not specifically, it did not uh, check for the pointer to the opposite party. Uh, so, you know, that pointer could possibly be null, so it would end up in a null pointer to reference. Um, so this is basically, you know, tried to uh, give you an uh, overview of how a DVD conversation looks. Uh, you have the client window that does the post message or get message, depending on the way this message is passed. And then it has a specific or for certain DDE functions or messages, it does uh, a callback to copy the data in from user mode because all, these, uh, all the data is stored in user mode. So it will either copy data in from user mode or copy data out from user mode uh, when ending up to the server. Uh, so you know, these copy data in or copy data out result in a callback. And in, 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 within that callback, you could destroy the opposite party. So uh, in this case, if you do that, you would have a null pointer reference that was exploitable in most cases. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the exploitability after this section. Uh, another class is on buffer reallocation. So many objects, you know, have item arrays associated with them, uh, and these are, you know, dynamically sized buffers. So we have, for instance, many item arrays. Uh, where when you uh, insert an item, it will, you know, on a certain, for a certain threshold, it will reallocate that memory to conserve memory. Uh, this is this happens either when you insert or remove entries from the buffer. If you, you know, remove all entries, it will free the buffer. Um, and any buffer that can be re reallocated in a callback, you know, has to be checked up on return. And if you don't do this, uh, you'll have. Uh, you know, there's a high probability of uh, ending up in a use after free condition. Uh, so this basically sums up where the checks need to be performed. Uh, so you get the number of item arrays, you get a pointer to the array, you look up the first item. Uh, this should actually revalidate the buffer pointer for each iteration. Uh, then you operate on that item, you might have a user mode callback in which you could resize the uh, array itself. And then when you return, you know, it, it, you usually check for if, they, uh, if there's uh, more items. And if you don't revalidate the total, total number of uh, items in the array, uh, you can be screwed as well. So, you know, the lack of these checks could easily end up in vulnerabilities. So there was a lot of them, a lot of them in uh, menu item handling. Uh, so menus, they hold an arbitrary number of menu items. Uh, these, like I said, are stored in a dynamically sized array. And after user mode callbacks, uh, Win32K did not in any way 
validate potential changes in this array. Uh, and there's no way to lock many items, so they couldn't do that. And you know, any of the XXX functions operating on a many item could potentially, was potentially vulnerable. Um, and you know, an attacker could easily you know, you know, reallocate the uh, callback or reallocate the buffer in a callback and trigger use after free. So this is how, how that looks. Uh, you have the menu object that you create using these standard APIs, create pop-up menu or create menu. Then you insert uh, menu items and you know, for, on, on creation of these, on the first item you reserve space for eight items. Uh, then on the ninth you will reallocate your array to hold an additional eight items. Uh, so this is how that will look. Um, in this case, uh, you know, you can see at the bottom that it does not revalidate the, uh, the pointer. It simply uses EBX or the register uh, and assumes that no reallocation has been made. Uh, it also stores the number of items before it enters the loop, uh, and it does not revalidate uh, this uh, you know, uh, count. So. Failing to do that, you could corrupt uh, adjacent memory. Uh, um, this is also one of the classes, uh, time of check to time of use. It's kind of similar to what we already talked about, but you know, when you leave a critical section, or the critical section is, itself is essentially used to prevent these issues. So when you leave the critical section and invoke a callback, uh, you, know, you have to recheck that the values are still the same. And this can be particularly dangerous in cleanup routines. So, you know, you could potentially invoke callbacks after something has been cleaned up, and then you can reinsert it. And this could end up in stale references and, you know, to objects or buffers. Um, so here's an example of that. Uh, they check the old tab window if that is null. Uh, if it is, it will exit. So, you know, we have to have this defined, and then later down here, it you know if this event hook is set, it will it may invoke a user mode callback, uh, and then you know knowing that this is not zero, it simply calls destroy window. However, we can destroy this window within the callback, so you know this will actually try to destroy a null pointer window object. So we map the null page and have an exploitable vulnerability. Um, yeah, this was uh, not really related, but you know, it's kind of nice to just mention. Uh, so when you validate handles, uh, you use the handle validation APIs, and these never lock the object itself. They simply just validate the, uh, the handles and return the, the object pointers. And you should avoid generic handle validation unless the structure of the object is irrelevant. Because um, this, you know, if you do so, you only check for the entry that it's valid and completely ignores the type. Um, and like I said, uh, functions that revalidate handles after callbacks uh, may no longer operate on the same object because the uh, uniqueness count to provide the handle entropy is only 16 bits. So. You know, doing this, uh, freeing and allocating a uh, sufficient amount of time so you could fool the kernel into, or fool Win32K thir Win into thinking that it still operates on the same handle. Uh, so here we see, you know, this is, the first one is, is a uh, lack of, completely lack of, uh, of uh, validating, you know, anything. It just gets the handle from the callback and then tries to look that up for, for the handle table and does not validate the type nor, nor the uh, length of the handle table itself. So, and the second one is a, uh, you know, it tries to use the generic type to look up a uh, image. So it assumes this to be a cursor object. Of course, you can provide anything. So this also may result in some exploitable bugs. So on to exploitability. So you know, most of these issues are related to use after freeze and null pointer references. So we'll look at those. Um, and in the case of use after freeze, we 
it mainly depends on the attacker's ability to manipulate the either the heap or the kernel pool, uh, the kernel heap, so to speak. Uh, I did um, my previous research was on the kernel pool, so if you're interested in, you know, do, looking up how to manipulate the kernel pool, you should read that. Um, there's not my in much public information on the kernel heap, so we'll we'll briefly just look at how that works. And you know, for for the reference, whenever you invoke a callback, you can easily hook the the functions because uh, you have the pointer stored in the pub. So you can just re, re, uh, replace the pointer and do whatever you like. Uh, so, so the kernel has a stripped down version of the user mode heap allocator. Uh, it has RTL allocate heap, RTL free heap. Uh, these are both used by the shared and the desktop heaps. Uh, notably, neither heaps employ any uh, front end allocators. Uh, so this, you can see this from uh, looking up the heap base and noticing that the extended lookup is null. Uh, this, was, this was also something that Chris uh, Valasek pointed out in his paper on the low fragmentation heap. Um, you know, just briefly that you know, if this condition was true, there was no front end heaps. So this means that there's no low fragmentation heap or look aside lists. So it makes it really easy to predict where allocations are made or how they're managed. Uh, neither heaps also encode or obfuscate the management structures. And we see this from the encode mask uh, being null. So we can easily uh, dump the desktop heap. Since it's mapped into user mode, we can dump it from user mode or we can dump it uh, from the kernel. Uh, so here we see uh, all the, uh, the information. Uh, we also have the commit routine which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, so the, uh, the, the blocks index points to the heap list lookup, which holds the uh, extended lookup pointer, which is null. And that is the uh, reason why it does not use any front end allocators. So you know, all the freed memory is indexed into a single free list. Uh, it's ordered by block size, meaning it has a granula granularity of 8 bytes. Uh, or 16, depending on the architecture. Uh, they use list hints to optimize list lookup. So since you store all the entries in the same array, uh, you obviously have to have some additional structures to speed up the lookup. Uh, and the requested memory is always pulled from the front of the over oversized heap chunk, uh, while the remaining fragment is put uh, back into the free list. Uh, and if the heap runs out of committed memory, it uh, tries to extend it by calling the commit routine. So you know you could easily, if you overwrite the commit routine, uh, this was one of the attacks on the heap user mode heap. You know, ways uh, years back, uh, you could do this uh, in the kernel since there's no obfuscation. Uh, even if you know there was encoding, you would be able to get the uh, uh, encoding key since the uh, heap itself is mapped into user mode. So for exploiting use after free vulnerabilities, uh, we can use Unicode strings to reallocate the uh, memory from the user mode callback. Uh, you know, this allows you to control the size and the contents of the heap block. So it's uh, you know, very flexible. The only ca caveat is that you, know, you cannot use word nulls or and the last two bytes of the string obviously has to be terminated with a null terminator. Uh, for the desktop heap, you can use set windows text uh, to set window text to set the uh, text to a window. Uh, on the session pool, you can use set class long pointer. And these are really the, the two you need to worry about. Uh, the shared heap is not, uh, there's not, it's not, it's not much used, so. Uh, so here you see that we'll replace the object with a string and the vulnerability or you know it tries to use this use a pointer in the string to perform some operations uh, so this easily you know this is easy and exploitable vulnerability since you can control uh, since it's a unicode string you can put anything really uh, as the pointer a lot of these bugs are you know uh, concerned with 
object locking or uh, whenever you, know, you replace the free memory, the first thing the code usually does is that it tries to lock the object or release the object. So it will use one of these pointers uh, to, to perform the locking. Uh, and this really allows you to do an arbitrary increment or an arbitrary decrement. Uh, and some targets in this context would be to try to hit the type value of a handle table entry. Because if the type value is a window or one, you can decrement that to zero and then destroy that object. And then since the zero type does not have a destroy function defined, it will call the null pointer. Uh, and you can map the null pointer and then control execution. Uh, you can also target APC objects. Uh, this was something that Juru uh, mentioned in a paper. So you could decrement the uh, um, as asynchronous procedure call uh, you know, context from user mode to kernel mode. So it would execute, uh, it would execute with kernel mode privileges. Uh, this is how that will look. Uh, here we see the uh, unlocking the user controlled pointer uh, of the uh, reallocated memory, uh, and this you know this is because uh, the uh, Win32 k calls or tries to call HM assignment lock, which is the assignment locking function, uh, on the pointer that this uh, freed memory holds or now reallocated memory holds. Uh, there's also uh, like I said null pointer vulnerabilities. These are you know, potentially exploitable on Windows since you can map the null page either by using, for instance, anti-allocate virtual memory or anti-map view of file. Uh, you know, many null pointer vulnerabilities are uh, concerned with window objects. Um, so you could map the null page, fake the window object, and then set up a fake window procedure. Uh, so if you have a flag that says that that window procedure is uh, server side or kernel mode, you would actually be able to execute or control the uh, procedure and execute with kernel mode privileges on any subsequent message sent to that object. So this, you know, this easily uh, shows that in doing so, you'll be able to instantly get uh, you know, arbitrary kernel code execution. So I have a demo on this. Uh, and we'll use the window object use after free that I that I uh, showed you earlier. So let's see. Uh, just gonna boot my VM. So I don't have a snapshot to cheat or anything. Should be fast. Um, so what we'll do is that we'll. Uh, you know, use the CBT hook to provide a Z order handle after which our new handle is inserted in the Z order chain. And uh, we will destroy this handle or this object in a subsequent callback and then reallocate that memory um, to control the locking operations that are performed subsequently. Uh, so this was a bit bigger than I expected it to be, but let's just resize this. So I'll run, I'll, I'll bring up two instances of, of consoles here, uh, then run the exploit. So this is gonna be partially interactive, meaning that it will pop a message box on the callbacks so it's easier to see. Uh, so I'll do window and then the command that I want to uh, execute. So in this case, I want to execute cal calc with system. Um, oh, oh, that was the wrong one, sorry. <laughs> Window 10. So now we are in the CBT hook. We set up the uh, handle to the window that we want to insert a new window after. Um, so what I've done here is I've you know, looked up the mapping in user mode, uh, found the kernel pointer, and then I can use my, uh, you know, the utility that has some screenshots on to dump that uh, address. So I'll just type in you know, shared info, fe8149z8, uh, 
and then this size of the object. So now you see that you know this is the object that we want to destroy later on. Uh, so if I you know click OK again, uh, what's going to happen is that it's going to destroy this window, and then we'll hit the next callback. Uh, oh, sorry, we'll hit the next callback, and then we'll destroy the window. So as you can see, we designed the Z order window in a CBT hook. We destroyed it within the callback, and then we reallocated that freed memory. Uh, so if I do this again, you see that um, you know all the strings or the string replaced the object. Uh, what I've also done is that I've you know since this is Unicode, I can insert pretty much any object pointer that I want as long as I avoid the double nulls. Uh, so this address here actually uh, points to the handle table entry uh, for the window that we will exploit or decrement. So we'll decrement its type and then destroy the window to you know, do the uh, uh, free type uh, destroy function or trigger the free type destroy function, which then you know, tries to uh, execute the null, or, uh, execute the null pointer, null type function pointer, which is null. Uh, so we map this page. Uh, I didn't mention this, but you can see at the top here that you know I mapped the null page for free type trampoline. Uh, so now when I click OK, uh, the, uh, something should happen. You, you got the on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> nice. Uh, so you know, just to see that this actually worked, uh, you know, there we go. We have system. That's quite nice. Um, so we'll move on to to the next section. So this was, you know, exploiting a fairly complex vulnerability. Uh, there's also a lot of vulnerabilities uh, related to null pointers. So the one that I accidentally clicked earlier uh, on this one was a null pointer vulnerability. Uh, so this one is, you know, it's the same one. Or it's a different one, but it does the same. It ends, ends, tries to uh, it maps the null page and executes with uh, kernel mode privileges. Uh, so what you want to try to do is you want to try to, you know, avoid the null page from being mapped, or uh, you know, uh, try to uh, mitigate the exploitability of some of these issues. So we'll talk briefly about mitigations. Uh, so mitigating used after free vulnerabilities is quite difficult. You know, it's generally hard because you usually will impact performance significantly. Uh, some approaches you could do is you could use delayed freeze. Uh, you could use uh, dedicated free lists. You could try to isolate the strings, meaning that uh, when you try to reallocate this memory, you have the string in a separate heap or something. Uh, you could try to track the allocations between ring transitions. So when you perform a callback, you would keep track of the memory allocations and then recheck those when you return and make sure that you know everything is sane. <clears throat> um, you know, for mitigating null pointer exploitation, uh, we can try to deny the uh, the allocation of null pointer uh, over, the, over the null page. Uh, there's some potential ways of doing this. Uh, we could either use system call hooking, or we could modify the page table entries, or we could try to use WAD manipulation. Uh, system call hook is, hooking is not really uh, any, a good solution because, you know, for the first, uh, it's not supported on x, x64 or 64-bit due to patch card that will check the system call table. Uh, and you also want to take a more generic approach because, you know, just hooking the function that potentially may make these calls could you know end up you failing to uh, uh, sufficiently hook all these functions? So you know there's two that are, I'm aware of that you can use, but you know say there were some additional, uh, or say there are some additional, and you you know we would miss those. So. Uh, PTE modification requires the page to be mapped, so that is not very ideal since we want to avoid the null page to be mapped. So we'll look at the word manipulation part. Uh, so the user mode process space is described by the virtual address descriptors. 
uh, and these are you know structured in self-balanced trees, which are binary trees. And you know what's neat about wads is that they're always checked before a page table entry is created. And this is, for instance, the, the way that Windows Im uh, implements the no-access protection. Uh, WADs are also used to secure memory, and they can be made non-deletable. Uh, so for instance, the process environment block and the thread environment block use this feature to prevent you from deleting the mapping. Uh, it's also used on the k-user shared data, share data section. Uh, so this is you know, really how a WAD3 looks. You have a process object uh, with a pointer to the WAD root, and then you know, have, have a binary tree that represents all the address ranges. So what, what, what we want to do is we want to make a WAD entry for the, the null page to prevent that from being mapped. Uh, so, with, uh, with, um, so I wrote a paper on this uh, you know, last month. And what we do here is we try to invert, insert a crafted WAD entry that restricts null page access for both the kernel and the user. So if you have a null dereference in the kernel, you, want to, you don't want anything to be mapped. You want to have an instant access violation. And you also want the uh, user not to be able to map that page. Uh, we avoid the deletion using the same method as the PEB or, and the thread environment, environment blocks. And we set the address range from 0 to FFFFF, uh, FFFF, uh, which is uh, you know, the entire uh, lower part of Windows that is not usually used unless you, you know, start a 16-bit process. Uh, we also set the protection to no, ac no access. Uh, you know, this gets us a long way, but there's a fundamental issue that you, know, you could still change the protection for this since you own the WAD, it's processed owned. So we use a special flag to prevent memory commits. So if the memory is not actually committed, you know, the, the protection cannot be changed. Uh, so this is, you know, we go to the leftmost branch and insert the WAD in the WAD tree. Uh, and you can see how this looks, you know, in WinDebug. Uh, you see the uh, mapping on top holding uh, or, you know, blocking uh, all the attempts or, you know, all the, reserving all the memory in the process uh, of this process. And looking up the PT entry for this, you see that it's not valid, so no page table entries has been created. Uh, so the, you know, the results for this seem to be quite good. Uh, you know, calling any of the traditional APIs for allocating memory, for allocating the null page, for you know, trying to free the null page or change its protection, you know, fail. Uh, you also have the map view of section, which is another way of mapping the null page, and that also uh, does not work. So I'll run a short demo of that as well. So like I said, this other bug was a null pointer vulnerability, easily exploitable. So what we'll do is we'll run our driver that inserts this uh, WAD entry on process creation. Uh, of course, you could inject into another process, but the idea is to load this driver up on loading windows. So you would have this mapping set up for all processes. So I need to be an admin to, to load the driver, obviously. Uh, So I'll hit K-load, which loads the driver. Um, I can do K-test just to see that. Now, actually, I'll just unload it first um, and run K-test. So you'll see that you know, it attempts to map the null page. It succeeds. So it can do memory reads, OK. It can do null page write, OK. So you know, that works. Uh, if I load the driver, uh, these tests uh, fail because we, you know, set up this wide entry. Uh, so, you know, trying all these uh, functions does not help you. Um, so, if I, you know, if I redo the exploit, uh, you know, it's it's not going to work because 
the allocated virtual memory that I use to set up the null page mapping uh, fails uh, with the, this, this exit code right here. Uh, so, you know, although it's difficult to address kernel exploitation on Windows, uh, you know, there's definitely some possibility of doing that. So, that's about sums up the, the um, talk. I'll just do a brief conclusion. Uh, so, you know, considering the future of the Win32K subsystem, you know, it needs a much more consistent and security-oriented design. Uh, it should not be necessary for the kernel to make calls back into user mode. Uh, you know, it's not, doesn't really make much sense. Uh, you should also, or Microsoft should also reconsider the performance benefit of using the shared user and kernel mem mode memory mappings. So mapping the uh, desktop heap and the handle table and the shared heap into user mode, although good for performance, uh, really, really helps exploitation. So you know, limiting the information available to the users is, is uh, probably a, a good idea. Uh, the, the window manager should also provide, you know, a, a mutual exclusion design on a per object basis, not globally lock the, uh, the module itself. Because uh, with all the uh, multi-core architectures, you know, this doesn't really help, so it would be better suited uh, uh, towards those. Uh, and this is also similar to what, I've, what is already done in the NT executive or the Windows kernel itself, as well as in GDI. So, you know, legacy components is always going to be, or, you know, probably are the most vulnerable parts of an operating system, meaning that the security was not usually designed uh, part of the original design. Uh, you know, Win32K is, is built around some very old G, uh, GUI subsystem code that, you know, before you had this transi transition in a, before you introduce Win32K.sys, they, they used uh, much of the same code. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult when you don't have security as part of the original design. Uh, and kernel exploitation, you know, requires knowledge about the address space, so limiting information is important. Uh, we've seen this being done on Linux, but it's, uh, you know, not done too much on Windows. Uh, and although difficult, you know, mitigating Windows kernel exploitation is definitely possible. Uh, obviously, it's harder since you don't have access to source code and you cannot really hook anything you want. So it's, it's more difficult, but it's, it's possible. Uh, so, yeah, some, some guys I want to thank and greet. Uh, uh, MSRC has been really cool about all these bugs. Uh, appreciate that. Um, and some good references in case you're interested in reading more. Um, you know, if you want to learn more about the kernel heap, you should really check out Chris Valasek's paper on the low fragmentation heap. Uh, you know, it's, it contains really much, all the information you need to do the manipulation and stuff. So, so that's it. Um, any questions? I guess you're all tired. <laughs> There's one question back there. Um, you talked about uh, validation of objects, and some people you can't really do handle validation for that. Yeah. Um, are there are there kernel provided uh, API functions for doing object validation, or is that something you have to do kind of on a you know, custom per object type basis? Yeah. So. Uh, you don't validate the objects themselves, you use the handle values. So you have the handle value and you provide that to a function that pr returns the pointer. And what that function does is that it validates the, uh, it looks the, up the entry in the handle table, checks the type that you specify. So, you know, that is how you get the, uh, uh, get the handle, get the pointer from a handle. Uh, there's no way to, you know, given that you have object pointer, there's no real way to, uh, you know, validate that 
Uh, so that's why you have the lock counts. Uh, and you know, increment the lock count to ensure that that object is always valid. Okay, so thank you.